screen so you can get started. Um, and does everybody have Rhino open to follow along or are we, okay. We're all, I can't actually see everybody. We all have Rhino to start working. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're nodding. Okay. On their right. Um, and if at any point you have questions or, uh, comments, feel free to shout them out or put them in the chat. I will try to keep track of the chat, but it's a lot of windows over my Rhino, Rhino window. So um, I can be a second set of eyes if uh, you need perfect. to break in. Thanks. Um, so you already have Rhino, so we don't need to talk about downloading it. Um, I'll do kind of an overview of the panels. Um, so these four windows are your space that you're actually building something. And there's the top right and front views and then a perspective view, which we'll talk about how to change that into isometric later. Um, but you can rotate them independently, move them around. And this uh, grid is the base for what you build on. Um, so this is the origin point at the center of the green and red. And from there, it's just a grid. You can grow, bid, build past the grid, um, and you can also make the grid bigger, but it's just kind of your starting point. Um, over here is the layers panel. So that's, you wanna keep track of your layers and um, separate things as much as possible into the layers that they can be in. Um, so you can, um, to move your face, actually, I'll open my um, You can add and subtract layers. Um, you can rename layers. Um, generally, the things on Mac are similar to the things on PC Rhino. Um, so you'll, you'll find that there are like slight differences, but generally you can do the same things. Um, so instead of like the radio dials, it's like check marks and things for um, selecting the layer, but it's pretty easy to understand. Um, so this um, dial is for selecting which layer you want to be on, or which layer you want to be selected. So when you make a new shape or make a new extrusion, it'll, op it'll appear in the layer that's selected. And that layer has to be turned on so you can also turn on and off other layers. You can lock them so that you can't edit them and you can change the color. So any, um, I'll change the color of this layer. Um, it'll change the extrusions and lines in all of the different views. And this color, it, um, it's nice to actually put a real hex color that you're interested in, in this color. And then when you export to Illustrator or whatever you're doing with the drawing, you can actually, it'll automatically move the color. So it's not, so you don't have to change the colors every time. So if you change the colors here, then they'll kind of be those colors for the rest of your project, which is pretty nice. Um, you can also change line types and um, materials and things here which can be useful, but um, isn't, I don't use it that often and um, it's more advanced. So um, you can get into that later. Um, up here is the properties. So if you select one of your shapes, you see the name and the layer and the colors and um, all kinds of different things you can do, materials and uh, edges and all kinds of things. Um, We'll use that a little bit, but um, generally you can do stuff without going to the properties panel. Um, on this side is the tools that you can use. So they're making a rectangle and making an extrusion and um, making faces, all kinds of different things. You can also type in commands. Anywhere on the screen, you can type in commands and um, so I'd recommend learning the commands rather than learning the um, 
buttons to press because although I think all of the commands are represented in these buttons and all of these um, toolbars at the top, it's nice to be able to type it in because it can work a lot faster. And then the last two things are these snap tools. So down here are the snaps. If I'm making a line, um, it's snapping right now to the end and the intersection. So that means that where two, two lines intersect and where one line ends, um, that's happening at this point, so it's snapping there. You can also snap to the center, to the midpoint. Um, so if I move to the middle, it'll snap to the midpoint. Um, and on curves, you can snap to tangents and um, perpendicular to another line. Um, so if I'm going like this, then it'll snap to perpendicular. And then another kind of type of snap or another um, set of snaps kind of is the these up here. And these are different in PC Rhino. I believe they're at the bottom. Um, but they're also pretty self-explanatory. Grid snap snaps to the grid. So with it on, I can only select um, points on the grid. Whereas with it off, I can put this anywhere right in the middle of the grid. Um, ortho, which is only horizontal and vertical um, instead of at angles. Planar, which is on the plane of the grid. Um, although if you do that on the front or the right, it'll be a vertical line, even though it's on the, like it's still on the front grid, but it's not on this um, horizontal perspective grid. Smart track is a nice way to, it's like a more advanced kind of snapping. So if you hover over something, it'll show gray um, mark and that whenever you get close to it, it'll um, allow you to snap to it from far away. So right now it's making this blue because I'm perpendicular to it still, even though I'm not touching it to that midpoint. Um, so you can kind of like use both and um, you can have multiple snap points with smart track on and you can do really interesting snapping um, pretty easily. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is gumball, which is this um, colored um, arrows and um, rotation things. Um, so you can move things with the arrows. You can move them on the plane and you can rotate them in any direction. Also, like most programs, if you click Alt and do anything, it'll copy it. So I can copy a bunch of shapes. And if I just click once, I can move this shape in any direction. So if I want to move it five units, it moves five units. I can also press Alt and click and move it five units again. Um, if I click on it, or if I press enter again, it'll, whoops. If I click on it again, press enter, it'll move another five. So that's, um, you can easily create long strings of things you wanna do just by doing that. If you need to create something really long, you might wanna use an array or something like that, but, uh, or, couple objects, it's nice to do that. So we'll start now that we have kind of the overview of the panels. Um, there are a couple other things I'll show and then we'll get into the um, tools that you can start to use. So um, the The units, um, it'll ask you when you start a new document 
to uh, specify the units. You can also change the units at any point by typing in units, unit, sorry, units with an S. Um, and you can change the type of units and the tolerance of the units. So if I'm changing to feet, it'll ask me if I wanna scale the model and I don't want to scale the model because it's already the right size, but I just like to change the units. Um, you'll also notice that I believe your backgrounds are probably gray and mine's white. That's because I've changed the colors so that it looks more like what it'll look like if I export or something. Um, so if I go into preferences, units is the one thing that's kind of like preferences that's not in preferences that you'll use all the time. Otherwise, if you go to Rhino and preferences, you can change a bunch of things um, about how it looks. So in colors, you'll see the viewport background, mine is white and yours might be gray. You can change that with the sliders. The grid colors and the axis lines. When you select objects, right now mine is yellow, but you can change that to any color you want that kind of thing. And lastly, I'll talk about selecting. So in any of these screens, you can um, select by dragging across like this, and it'll select it in all the screens. If I select the other way, so that was from the top left, if I select from the bottom right, it'll select anything from the top left. It'll select only if something is included in fully in the selection. So right now, I only included this box fully in the selection, so only it's selected. But if I select from the bottom right and I don't select them fully, it'll still select them both. As long as something is selected, it'll select the entire object. Does this make sense so far? Um, and to move around, you can um, zoom in and out on the trackpad or with the scroll wheel, I believe. And, or you can scroll with the scroll wheel and then zoom in, out, zoom in and out with the, um, you guys have track mouses, right? Where you can, um, okay, so you can scroll up and down. Um, then you have to scroll. If you scroll with the Alt on, it'll zoom in and out. If you, I never use these. If you um, scroll with Shift, it'll um, move around. There it is. If you uh, click Control and click and drag, you can move around. And then if you Alt and scroll, you can zoom in and out. Um, and that's for perspective. It's similar that um, Alt and Scroll is in and out, Control and Click is Orbit, and Shift and Scroll should be panning. Is that generally working for people? No, but right clicking and dragging will uh, will pan and rotate also. Okay, perfect. That's the, 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 sh the shift control is not working on mine, but right clicking is. Okay. Um, it's always different depending on your input because all the mouses are different and trackpads and things like that. Um, so we'll get into some basic um, commands. The most basic might be line. So if you just type in line, and I'll turn on grid snap because um, it's nice to have when you're on the grid. Usually it's not very uh, convenient when you're actually building something, but in this case. Um, so you just click one point, you click another point. You can also um, set coordinates. So if I say zero, 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 
X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, it'll move the first point to the origin. And then if I say one, 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 it'll move it to the, um, the point at one, one, one. And that'll also move it vertically in the front and right views. Um, there are similar commands for rectangles. So if you type in rect, you can um, Okay, um, you should be able to put it, you should be able to click it once and then click it again for the opposite corners and it'll make a rectangle. You can also make uh, three, you can select three points on the rectangle. So if you type in rectangle and click the three point button or press P, the one, the letter that's underlined, if you press that, it'll do, if you click P and press enter, it'll, automatically click that button for you. So now you get to select three points. So if I select in the perspective view here, here, and here, it'll be an angled rectangle. Now that you have a rectangle, you can extrude it. So if you type in extrude, extrude curve, um, you can extrude it. This is going by grid points. Um, so that's three grid units long. Um, and you can move. So as well as using gumball to move, you can also type in move. So I typed in move and I'll click the point I want to move from and then I'll click the point I want to move to and it moved four blocks over. You can also at any point if you click enter or space it'll um, redo the command that you did before. So if I, I just clicked space and it came back up, move came back up. Um, so you can also select from any point, it doesn't have to be on the object and move, and it'll move the object still. If you don't select anything and press move, it'll um, ask you which object you want. So you click on the object, you click enter, and then you can do the same thing from here to here. You can rotate. So in addition to um, the gumball tools, which often, often it's nice to use the gumball tools when you're um, moving and it doesn't really matter where, you, where you're going, or if you wanna do specific steps and you're typing in the distance. Um, but if you're using snap tools, uh, often it's nice to use the commands. So if you type in rotate, select the object, um, it, you can rotate on the plane. So in perspective, it'll be horizontal. And then in the other views, it'll be um, whatever way you're looking. So in perspective, if I rotate, it'll rotate horizontally. If I rotate in the front view, it'll rotate um, vertically according to the front view. You can also rotate 3D. So instead of just rotating on the plane, I can rotate 3D and select the object. You select the rotation axis. So if I want to rotate along this line, then I'll select this point and I can rotate along that line. And once I've selected the first point, I can type in 90 degrees and it'll rotate at 90 degrees.
once you press enter. So if I type in uh, negative 90 degrees, it'll rotate back. While you're rotating, if you do regular rotate, um, and click C, enter, it'll copy it. So you can rotate like normal, um, and you can rotate it a bunch of times, and enter, and it'll save all of them, including the original one. You can also copy with another command, so copy, and just like move, you can click the first point and click a second point and it'll move the copy. Or it'll, it'll copy it from um, the original to a new place. You can scale. If you type in scale, you click the origin point and the first reference point, then you can click a second reference point and it'll make the shape bigger. One of the most important tools that I use when I'm using Rhino is scale 1D. So often I don't wanna scale in every dimension. I wanna scale in one or maybe two. So if you type in scale 1D, it'll only scale in one dimension. So it's the same kind of thing. I click the origin point and the first reference point. And no matter where I select, where I click, it'll only change in along perpendicular to the um, line between the origin and my first reference point. So I can click on one of my other shapes and it'll select, it'll make sure that um, it's aligned with that shape. Any questions so far? Um, so sometimes you're dealing with, um, usually you're either dealing with extrusions or with lines. So if you're dealing with a bunch of lines, you can select all of these and just delete, um, and they'll delete. If you're dealing with another way of making lines is polylines. So that's where you can click a bunch of points. So if you do polyline, you can click a bunch of times and it'll make a single shape. So if you click it, it'll select the entire thing. You can also um, move these, these are control points. So when you select something, you can move the, um, each point using these uh, circles. Um, so when you, if you're doing a line kind of drawing, um, another really helpful tool is trim. So if you type in trim, it'll tell you to select the cutting objects. So I'd like this shape to cut this shape, cut these ends off. So I selected the cutting objects and then select the object to trim and it'll trim anything that it's touching. Um, along that line. So if I click on the inside, it'll trim the midpoint because it's uh, trimming to these two points. Um, if you'll remember, this rectangle is at an angle. So if I trim again um, and don't have apparent intersections clicked, then um, I'll select the cutting objects and because it was touching the, um, the origin point, it thought that I wanted to delete it all, but I didn't. So um, I'll make one that it's not touching. Um, and I select the cutting objects, but apparent intersection is not on. It won't do anything when I click this line because they're not intersecting at all. But if I turn on apparent intersections, then from the top view, it looks like these two lines are intersecting, even though they're not. So I can trim them. Um, and then the other button here, which also can be useful, 
is um, extend cutting lines. So if I have a shape, I, if I have this line here, um, and I want it to cut off this square, but I don't want to, I could also do scale 1D and select the object and the reference point and the first, or the origin point and the reference point, and then extend it so that I could trim, or I can do trim and have extend cutting lines on. So I'll select the cutting object and then select the object to cut. And it'll cut it even though that line doesn't extend all the way. It'll pretend like it extends all the way. And again, I had apparent intersections on. So even though those, it kind of creates a plane on the top view that it'll cut anything in that plane. Let's see. There are a couple tools that you should, I'd really like you to take away from this with. Um, so scale 1D was one of them. I find that incredibly useful to scale extrusions and things. Set point is also a really incredible, incredibly useful tool. So I've created this shape, but often, um, I'll give an example. So if I have an extrusion, here, and I create a polyline, and I select a bunch of points, it didn't look like it when I was making it in the top view, but it was actually snapping to some random points. So now in the perspective view, it's going all over. Um, so to Often you want to make that shape 2D along the top view so that you can extrude it or whatever else. Um, because if I extruded this now, it would make a really weird um, 1D extrusion because it's at an angle. So if I do set point, SET, PT, enter, um, and I uncheck X and Y but only check Z, and click set points. Then I can specify where I'd like it to be and it'll, it'll make it 2D. So it went from at some random angles to completely 2D. You can also do that in the um, other dimensions. So if I do set point and set Y, then Um, in the top view, you'll see that it's um, only um, choosing one Y um, coordinate and pushing all of the points to that coordinate. So scale, one, scale 1D and set point are some of the things that I'd like you to take away from this. Um, You can join and explode these um, curves. So if I click explode, each of these will now be an individual curve. You'll see that I'm selecting one thing in the top view, but it doesn't know which one I want to select, whether it's the curve or the extrusion, because they're both on, on top of each other. So you can It'll turn, it'll make it purple, and then you can select which one you want to click. So you can select the extrusion, and it'll select the extrusion. Um, I'll just delete that for now. So now we have a bunch of individual line segments, or you could make a bunch of individual line segments. And then if you want to make them into another shape, explode was to break them apart. Join is to bring them back together. So join two curves and now they're one object. I don't know if you saw that. Um, when you click join, in this bottom left corner, it says two, two curves joined. Um, that can be convenient to see how many curves are joined 
and how many cur curves they're joined into. Um, so if this was, I'll explode this again. And if this was just slightly off and I didn't see it and I joined them, it says unable to join curves because um, they, they're off, so it didn't know where to connect them. Um, just two more um, tools before we go into contours. Um, move face and move edge. So if you type in move edge, um, make an extrusion or get one of your extrusions um, and select an edge. This will allow you to I think I need some more shapes so that it's not snapping to the horizontal plane. Oh, maybe I didn't press enter. So I selected the faces that I want to move and I'll move them like this and it creates a um, shape with those points moved or those uh, faces moved. So if I do move edge, select and press enter, I forgot to do that last time, and move it to, I don't know, there. <laughs> um, you move the edge and then it'll kind of find how to make the um, extrusion work with that edge. So now that edge is down here. Any questions so far? Okay. So one of the um, first things you'll have to do um, when you start a project in Rhino is work with contours. So I find a really useful place to look for contours is CAD Mapper. Um, sometimes you'll get contours from um, a professor TA, but other times you'll have to look for them yourself. Um, so if you, uh, it's cadmapper.com, you can create an account and if you want to, you can do this now and download some contours, or you can just create some random shapes. Um, I'll be talking for a little bit, so you should have enough time to um, just create the account, and then you might have to sign into your email to verify. But um, you can select a size of a file. So right now I'm on campus, and um, you can get a free file up to one kilometer um, and you can kind of patch these together too or you can purchase a file for a lot um, a much bigger file and you can get the topography so the free version only goes um, as close as four meters um, if you want one meter contours or something less than that you have to pay for them um, but four meters works because uh, the It'll, we'll be able to interpolate between them. It'll also include the buildings, which is really nice. And if you select Rhino 5, you can create a file and you'll be able to download it. Um, so I've already downloaded. Um, a file. I'm going to select all of these layers. So I'll um, select all of them by clicking on one and then shift clicking on another one. And I can click on turn on and it'll turn them all on. Um, 
So I've turned on what I've downloaded from CAD Mapper. And it's a really detailed view. Generally, uh, James, how did you get that in to Rhino? Um, so when you download it, it'll be a Rhino file and you can just double click and it'll open the file in a Rhino window. If you wanted to move it to another Rhino file, um, you could open it and it would look like this. Um, you can just select it all and do, when you're moving between files, usually it works best to do Command C. So you can just do Command C and then open the, whatever file you wanna put it in and Command V. And it made it a bit really big in this file, but it's uh, here. So I'll delete this file. Um, it also separates it into paths and roads and um, buildings and topography. And it actually makes the contours for you. So it has the contours like this, but then it also makes the shape that um, the contours make. So it's a really nice um, way to get the topography of the site. Um, sometimes if it's Sometimes your site will be so small that it doesn't really matter what the topography for an entire um, campus is. So then you'll have to um, go from contours to your own site. So I'll show you how to do that without, um, if you didn't have that surface, um, I'll show you with just contours. So there are plenty of ways to do this. Um, I've heard, I don't know, five different ways um, that you can make contours or make uh, topography. I find the easiest is patch. So um, if I, I have these contours and I need to create a boundary, so I'll do a rectangle. And the nice thing with patch is that it doesn't really matter if the contours are exact. Um, so you can have breaks in the contours and um, you can have multiple contours um, overlapping and things. As long as it'll try to match the surface to the lines that you have. So it kind of um, will get rid of any mistakes that um, if the contours aren't perfect. Um, so I've created a bounding box and I need these contours. I also need to think about in um, the vertical dimension where the contours are. So CAD Mapper does this really well. It has um, the contours at the vertical that they're supposed to be. So um, each contour is four meters up and it, it shows it as four meters above the next as I click on them in front view. But if you don't have, um, them separated. If the contours are only on one layer, you'll have to do that by yourself. So if these layers, if these contour lines I'll do set point to set them vertically to the same as this layer. So now all four of these are on the same layer. So to move these to their own layer, I select all of them and then with gumball i'll um, click and do i'm trying to lower these sometimes you would try to raise them but i'll try to lower them um, so i'll click and do um, negative four and it'll move those three down and then i'll unselect the i'll select the two and i'll say 
negative four. So it moved those two down and then I'll select the last one and do another negative four and it'll move that one down. Um, so you can go through large numbers of contours and just deselect and move everything, deselect one more and move everything, deselect another one and move everything and you can get this um, shape of contours um, going down. Have people uh, started getting a CAD mapper file or would you rather, you can also just like make a bunch of lines and uh, test it out that way. Can you go over that part one more time? Yeah. The tag back in here, but I'm like trying to figure it out. Sorry, what? Uh, she, sorry, we're all you, we're all together, so we use one microphone. Um, okay. uh, she has the CAD mapper file, but she just wants you to go over it one more time just to make sure she does it right. Okay, the contours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. I'll make some random contours here just to have another example. All of these are on the same um, vertical plane. Oh, I'm sorry. I made those on the front view, so they um, they were at a, they were uh, vertical. I'll make them again on a horizontal plane. So now all of these are on a horizontal or a vertical uh, plane. They're all at zero vertically. So to make a patch surface, I need to move them um, vertically to where the contours actually should be. So if this contour is at zero. This con contour will be at one foot above the um, next. And this one will be at two feet above um, this original one. So I'll select the ones that I want to move and I'll move them and I'll, if the difference between contours is four feet, then I'll click four. If it's one foot, then I'll click one. Um, I'll click four. And then I'll um, shift click to, control click to uh, deselect one. And now I only have one selected. So I'll click the gumball again and move it up four. And so now, these contours are at different levels according to where they actually would be in real space. CAD mapper already does that, so you don't have to worry about it on your CAD mapper file. But if the contours were, um, if they were just on one plane, you'd have to do that. So now that we have the contours on their own planes and we have a bounding box around them just by making a rectangle, we will try to patch. So if you type in patch, um, and we will select the points and actually control click the rectangle because that's not one of the points to patch. It'll give us these options. Um, so the spans, the U and V, are the level of resolution that you'd like. Um, so if you have, if you type in a hundred, it'll do a hundred different lines and then connect those lines into a surface. If you do 20, it'll only have 20 lines in each dimension. Um, for now, I'll do 20 um, because it goes a lot faster. But if you're doing a large site, it's nice to have um, more, more than 20 and take a little bit of time to uh, make it. Um, sniff, stiffness, I think yours is set at 0.1 right now. That's really not very stiff. Um, so for contours, you can go up to 10. I find 10 is generally a good amount for a big site. Sometimes on a smaller site, there are more contour differences. 
So you'll want to go down to, I've gone down to something like um, 0.1, um, and I'll show you another tip for if there are lots of different changes. Um, so we have the spans that I'll set them at 20, but you might want to set them higher. And then the stiffness, we'll try 10 for a big site like this and we'll click OK and it'll work. Um, and did it work? There it is. Um, you do want to select the batting box. I thought it was a separate, um, a separate place to click the bounding box, but select all of it together and it'll make one shape. So now we have this shape, which is pretty accurate when it's uh, close to these lines. And that could work as the topography. Um, but there's this one point where there aren't very many lines around and um, it dips down really weirdly. And that's not really how it works. So let's try again. And before we do that, we wanna give it more information so that it knows what to do here. So we'll do a polyline. If you didn't get the same site as me, just like you can make a polyline in any place um, that the contour is something um, else. So in here, I would want the contour to be as tall as this, or up here, I'll want it to be as tall as this. Um, so I'll just kind of make another intermediate contour. And I'm not sure where that is vertically. So right now it's on the horizontal plane. So I'll set PT and just do Z and then align it to the contour I want. So now there's another line for it to take into account when it's patching the surface. So if I do patch now, and I'll do the same stiffness and everything. Now it won't go down nearly as far here. You might want to add another one, and, um, but that can kind of get you a working site. Um, so I said stiffness for a big site can be up to 10. Um, if there's lots of change, you might want to put it down to 0.1. Um, you can also do curves or you can do points instead of um, lines. So right now it's taking into, into account the lines. Um, instead, I can select all the curves and I'll command click the bounding box. So I'm only selecting the curves um, and I'll click edit PT S on. So edit. Oh, it is just, okay. Edit PT on. And now these are the points that have made the, um, the contours. So um, like when you clicked for a polyline, all of these points are what makes the contours. And if I, um, you can select things by doing cell and then um, the type of thing. So if I do cell PT, it'll select all the points. If I do cell um, CRV, it'll select the curves. So if I do cell PT or surfaces, something like that. Uh, so cell PT, it'll select all the points that I have. And I'll also select the bounding box. And then I'll do patch. And we'll lower the stiffness to, let's try one. And my rhino's frozen. <laughs> Patch is something that you want to save before you do it because it can be a huge task for your computer to do depending on how much um, patching there is. Um, so you save and then you can patch. Um, I think I might have to force quit. But it's pretty much the same. You just do it with points and it'll be able to um, 
to do a more accurate uh, topography. Um, so if you have edit points on, edit PT on, um, you really don't want that most of the time. So to turn it on, off, you do uh, points off, points off, and it'll turn them off. Um, so now that we have a patched surface, we might want to have a volume for the site. Um, so I'll, um, this is the patch from um, CAD Mapper. Your patch, um, we don't have to do this step um, if you did a separate patch. But if you take it from CAD Mapper, you have to turn it from a mesh into a shape that can be more easily manipulated. So. Um, we'll type in mesh to NURB. It's uh, the type of ob object. Um, so if you select it and type that in, it'll create, in addition to the mesh, it'll create a surface now that's easier to work with. Um, but if you did the patch with the um, U and V values, you don't have to do that step. It's already the kind of surface. Um, so now we can make uh, um, an extrude, or uh, if you type in box, it's making an extrusion, but you don't need the curve. So um, we'll say that that's what we want our um, site to be. And with gumball, I can move it down so that I want I want just the box below the topography surface. Um, so to do that, we'll use Boolean um, tools. Um, so Boolean split is the most useful one usually, I find. So if you do Boolean split, um, it's kind of like trim, but for shapes, uh, for 3D shapes. Um, so I'll select the surface to split, which is the box. And then the cutting surface, which is the topography. And click Enter. And now I have this bottom shape and this top shape. And I have this bottom shape, which is really what I want. So I'll open another layer and call it uh, base or whatever. Um, and I'll, uh, if you right click on that and click um, move objects to this layer, it'll move this object to the base layer. And then if that's all I want, I just have that. Um, so, now that we've kind of made our um, project to get it out of Rhino, um, and this is the last big thing. Um, I know 1020 is when class ends, right? So um, should be um, on time. Um, often make 2D is what you'll use to export if you're trying to go to Illustrator or some other 2D form. So make 2D takes the 3D drawing in Rhino and makes a 2D drawing still in Rhino. So um, maybe we want an isometric view. So instead of the perspective view where things are going to vanishing points, we want it to be um, parallel. We'll go to view, set view, isometric, and then you can choose any of these. 
and it'll make an isometric view of this. You could also do make 2D with um, perspective, but um, it just depends what you want to do. You can then you can go back to view, set view, and perspective, and it'll go back to the perspective. Um, but either way, we can make 2D um, with this. So if we do make 2D and we want to make this object 2D, um, it gives us this dialog box, which you can get into more detail later. Um, but you can maintain the source layer. So if you have a bunch of layers and you want the same layer, you want the 2D drawing to have the same layers as the 3D drawing does, then you can maintain the source layers um, and you can tell it to select different lines to put in the 2D drawing. But if you make 2D, this is another thing that if you have, if it's a large drawing, um, it can take a while. So you might want to save before. It'll make a 2D drawing. So in the top, whatever it looks like in the parallel view is what will show up in the top view. This is a, I'll go back to um, perspective. So this is now just a drawing in perspective and it looks exactly like it did in the parallel view in the top view. And I can edit this just like normal. So if I want to trim, uh, I have to explode it. I think I have to explode it. Um, sorry, I have to ungroup it. So um, explosion and join is for a single shape. So one circle or one polyline um, can be exploded and joined. Grouping and ungrouping is for lots of shapes. So um, I could select it all because it was one group and I ungrouped it and now I can um, select individual pieces. So if I want to trim, I can still do that. I'll trim and be able to trim all of these corners off or whatever I want to do. Um, and now to export, I find the easiest way to export is usually to just go to select something that you want to export and then do export selected. You can save it as something. Um, and I'll save it as an Illustrator file so that you can open it in Illustrator. And it'll ask you about the um, scale. So I don't really like using this scale. I'll show you another way to do this in the future or after this, but um, you can select what you want the drawing size to be um, according to what you what is the drawing size or what is the rhino size of the model. So right now I have it set to one to one. So if this topography is, um, I don't know, a mile or it was a kilometer wide, it'll show up as a kilometer wide in Illustrator, which is completely unusable. Um, so I'll have to scale that down. Another way to do that is to scale and I selected an origin point and then I'll do one divided by 12. So it'll divide the entire drawing or it'll scale it by 12. So now instead of every foot, it's every inch. And then I'll do scale again and select the origin and do one divided by 64. And now it's at um, one foot equals 60, one sixty-fourth of an inch equals one foot, um, just an architectural shape, scale. And now if I export selected, file export selected, and save, I can export at one feet, at one to one, and it'll still, um, it'll be a sixty-fourth of an inch because I already scaled it in Rhino. Does that make sense? Um, just some um, troubleshooting. 
often if you can't edit something, it's because it's a mesh. So mesh to NURB is pretty helpful as like just something to try. Just like we did with the um, mesh from the contours. For export selected, I find often you have to move something to the origin for it to show up in Illustrator. Um, so sometimes when I export and it's way far away from the origin, just nothing will show up in the Illustrator um, page. Um, if I move it to the origin, then it'll show up much easier. Um, you can also uh, make this a PDF, I believe. Um, I don't know if you're actually using Illustrator yet. So if you're not using Illustrator yet, there are other ways you can export. Yeah, PDF. Um, and sometimes the perspective view gets a little bit weird. It'll um, be, right now it's um, rotating around whatever is over here, which is kind of annoying because I'd rather it be rotating around maybe this shape or something. Um, this happened more in, or it was worse in the last version of Rhino, but um, it's still like the orbiting is still a little bit weird. So to fix that, I'll do zoom and uh, T for target, or I can click this, T enter. And I'll select the point that I want it to orbit around and select the view window. And now it'll orbit around that point instead. So that can be helpful to reor reorient what you're doing. Um, are there any questions about anything? I can go into more detail or, um, or go into other tools to use or um, we can talk about questions. How much is tutoring through Beehive? Cost? Yeah. It doesn't cost anything. Okay. Um, it's is it just then a matter of scheduling? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I can share that right now. If you go to our website, there are some tutorials about Rhino and Revit. Um, and you can also um, ask the help desk. Um, so you can type in a message and it'll get emailed to us and we'll either respond with a message or we can set up a time to meet and talk through the problem. And the, the email or the website is psubeehive.com. You can just search that on Google and it'll show up. Um, and select the program because that'll de determine who we send it to to fix it. There are um, a bunch of people in Beehive and we each have specific interests and uh, things we're best at. Um, another tool that is uh, useful is dif distance. So to measure things, you just click one point, click another point, and it'll tell you the distance. Um, and that's in any dimension. So it's 200 feet. James, are there any tools that you find particularly useful when you're um, cleaning up a model for 3D printing? Hmm. I think you're just using extrusions to print to 3D models. I've only done this like two times, so I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, The most useful might be select duplicates. Um, so I was doing this brick wall that I was 3D printing and um, I had made a bunch of bricks, but the bricks were kind of overlapping or there were some bricks that I had twice. Oh, here's something where the zoom is kind of messed up. So I'll do zoom uh, T for target and click here. And now I can move around like normal. Um, so if I have a bunch of boxes, um, but one of them is on top of the other, 
Um, okay. Um, if you have like a ton of objects, you can do cell dup. Um, so cell duplicate, and it'll select one of the um, one of the objects that is a duplicate. Like it'll keep it'll keep the original one and won't select that one, but it'll select all of the extra objects that are just um, there. So now you can delete it, and there will only be one copy here now. I think that might be the most useful for 3D printing. Um, you can also get into Booleans. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways to Boolean um, cut things. So I showed Boolean split, which is uh, a cutting object cuts something else, which is, uh, I'll change the color. This is a, an annoying color. Um, so that's where this cutting object splits this into two shapes. Boolean union will make it all into one shape. Boolean intersection will do where both of the shapes overlap. Um, so it's just the one cube in the middle here. Uh, Boolean difference will um, take one of the shapes away and anything that it's interacting with. Um, and then Boolean two objects is um, interesting. I um, just realized that this was a thing today or yesterday when I was um, preparing, but Boolean two objects, you can select the two objects and then it'll click through your different options. So um, it's a nice tool for that. Um, and that's just useful in general, but it might be useful for different. Um, two other things that I noticed while I was doing this, um, these things that show up in the middle are ISO curves. So they kind of show where the surface is, but often they're not extremely helpful. Um, you saw them also on this surface. So all of these are ISO curves. If you go to properties and this first panel and just click show ISO curves again, click it off, they'll delete. And if you click this and the box, because it's just an extrusion, doesn't have any um, isocurves. Um, but you can turn off isocurves and it'll turn them off. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking, uh, if you right click on the view or on the name of the view, the top or the perspective, you can change. You guys have probably been in um, wireframe. So that's where you can see all of the lines. I find Shaded is often nice so that you can sh see the shapes instead. Um, you can do rendered, te technical, where uh, you're doing like dotted lines, um, lots of different things that you can um, look through. Um, although some of the more advanced ones, even shaded sometimes, can slow your computer down because the wireframe is just the basic, uh, the most basic way to do it. Any other questions? That's awesome. You packed a lot in. <laughs> yeah, I hope I, uh, I hope you followed and <laughs> it wasn't too fast, but um, remember if anything, if you only remember a couple of things, scale 1D is really important. Set PT um, is really important. Um, those are the most important things I can uh, tell you. You can learn everything else as you go.